Welcome to the Entre Ed Talk podcast. We are your hosts, Toy Hirschman and Laura McCall. Join us as we dive into incredible stories from inspiring entrepreneurs around the world. Whether you are an educator looking for ideas to engage students, a new learner, or someone who wants to be inspired, our guest journeys and their ideas will give you resources to create value and take your own leap into entrepreneurship. We are so looking forward to sharing our message with you. And don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe to the Entre Ed Talk podcast on whatever platform you listen. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another exciting episode of the Entre Ed Talk podcast. We are delighted to have with us Kevin Antimo. He is the founder of Experiential Communications, creator of the Global Innovators Academy, and the instructor of the Interview and Innovator Experience. Previously, Kevin was a director of public relations for Duke University's business school, and prior to that, managed the media relations for IMD in Switzerland. Kevin lived and worked in Switzerland for eight years and in Germany for two. He has led communications initiatives in various countries around the world. I am so excited. We are so excited to have you here, Kevin. Welcome. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to see your faces. I've listened to so much of your great interviews uh, over the last couple of months. And so thrilled to have the opportunity to meet you both and to share some insights, hopefully, with your audience. Oh, well, thank you for that compliment. And we are equally excited to have you today. So, so many things to dive into. Um, and, and I love your bio is shorter than we normally have, but that's <laughs> actually a really, really great thing because uh, it gives us an opportunity to dive into so many things. But before we do that, yeah. um, I would love to get a little bit more information like about you, let our audience know kind of where your career trajectory went and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, cool. Thank you. So I am really, I'm a communications person, a marketing communications person. Uh, as you mentioned, I lived in Europe for a number of years, uh, have worked in higher education since 2007. Uh, most of my work, uh, and then I, I worked for a couple of different institutions. Uh, in 2013, I started my own business, Experiential Communications. Most of my work has been focused on doing communications workshops for researchers and academics. A couple of years ago, I got this idea that really the communications training that I'm doing for researchers and academics is something that students really need. And so that's where I kind of came up with this idea for the Global Innovators Academy to provide experiential communications training for students uh, so that way they can benefit in a number of different ways. Uh, that led me to start this program called Interview and Innovator. Uh, interview and Innovator is basically this experience in which students interview different innovators who are of interest to them uh, and then write content that is published online. And so that's really my number one passion. And there's a whole uh, program focused around this for entrepreneurs, for students who are interested in learning more about entrepreneurship. Uh, I am a big believer in the power of interviewing and the power of networking working, uh, building one's digital footprint. I mean, I've seen that for myself, how that's helped me throughout my career. I imagine you've seen that throughout your career in terms of both individually as well as starting the Entre Ed podcast. I imagine that you've seen some of the benefits of connecting to others. Why can't students do the same thing? So that's what I'm trying to do. That's incredible. Um, I'm interested if you could, if you could, I'm sorry, Laura, I mean to take, take a question. <laughs> we, tried, we tried a tag team, but I just had a, I have a a thought. Um, can you explain a little bit more about what, maybe give an example of what experiential communications looks like? Yeah. So, you know, I didn't necessarily have in my mind what I would be doing today when I started my business seven years ago. But one thing is I'm, I've always been really passionate about teaching. Uh, I also have sat in through many, 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 many dry lectures over the years, both uh, in my work uh, as a student, as well as uh, having worked in you know two different uh, business schools, and you know I'm a big proponent of experiential experiential learning, and so basically it's kind of you know bringing those two words together, experiential. So my the workshops that I do for researchers and academics, I, I will share some content obviously, and kind of you know set the, the tone and give some people some uh, examples and best practices. But the real learning happens, especially from a communications point of view. I think this is true for many. Uh, different fields, but from a communications point of view, you know, you can, you know, read all sorts of books on how to do a podcast. You can read all sorts of books on how to write an article and how to use social media. You don't really learn until you actually start doing. And so that's really where, you know, I've put together curriculum 
uh, for researchers and academics that is focused on doing, and, I'm, and I've done the same thing now with the Global Innovators Academy and particularly with this interview and innovator experience. Uh, you know, I am not going to tell a student who to go interview. I am not gonna tell the student how to go, you know, I'm not going to make an introduction for a student to go interview someone. The student needs to do that. The student needs to write the article. I'll provide the instruction, I'll provide the support, I'll provide the editorial feedback, but the real learning happens experientially. You know, you're talking about like, I think we are lacking in students being able to talk one-on-one. -on -one. They're mm -hmm. so used to right here at the phone. Yep. Um, and I've been with friends whose kids text their parents from their bedroom. And their parents are like, are you home? Get down here and talk to me. You know, really, that's happened. And I just crack it off because, you know, not that it hasn't happened to me. Of course it has. Um, not that I'm not tempted to do the same, but you're right, you know, we have allowed our society to hide behind electronics and yeah. not communicate. And then the whole idea of your experiential communication, I think is awesome in the interviewing because it is an experiment. We don't get it right the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm sure students blunder through questioning. We also talk about ecosystems and it's a great way for them to build their own community ecosystem of folks that they looked up to and uh, mentoring. Absolutely. I think you're doing a lot of mentoring. With Absolutely, this. yeah. It's something that, with the interview and innovator initiative that you're doing, um, yeah. I wonder how, how that experience is really difficult for for students right off the bat. Like yeah. That would, be, that would be really intimidating. That's intimidating to me right now. If I picked somebody that I admired and looked up to at, who is an innovator, and then I went and tried to interview that person, which I'm guessing is how that process gets rolling. Traditionally, informational interviews. And so I, for example, I was interested back in college in being a sports journalist. And I had the opportunity as a, for part of an informational interview assignment to go interview whoever I wanted. And I chose a uh, sports reporter who was covering the local uh, football team. Great conversation. I quote unquote picked this guy's brain. Uh, you know, had a great conversation, wrote a paper, very important distinction, wrote a paper for the professor, got my grade, that was the end of it. What I would like to do, what I'm what I'm doing with interviewing innovators, taking this to the next level. So instead of me just going and interviewing a professional and picking that person's brain, what I'm gonna do instead is write an article about that. So then what happens, right? Suddenly, it's not just a pick the brain of that of that individual. You know, that person is getting visibility, number one. I'm able to showcase my communication skills, uh, number two. Number three, I'm building my digital footprint in, in, the, in the process of doing that. I'm learning to promote content because, as you know, just because you create a piece of content doesn't mean the world's going to come and consume that content. You have to promote it, right? So students are learning to promote their content. So when I write, wrote my paper for the professor, I got feedback from one individual, the professor. If I am creating content and it's published online, I'm getting feedback from you know a whole host of people. Some of it might be junk feedback from you know trolls. Okay, learn how to interpret that. Some of it might be really substantive feedback from you know either the individual I interviewed from someone else. So it's kind of taking and for a student who's interested in entrepreneurship. Uh, I think it's really important to take the time to learn from others and to build these communication skills, build the networking skills, uh, learn how to establish your digital footprint even at a very early age. Uh, you know, there's a, a quote from somebody who I really admire. His name is Bill Fisher. He's one of my former colleagues at IMD. Uh, and the quote is, if ideas move the world, conversations move ideas. Ideas at rest add no value. Only ideas in motion have a chance of becoming innovation, right? And so creating a, a platform, creating a means for students to have interactions with entrepreneurs, to hear their stories, as well as then to, you know, have conversations with potentially the person they're interviewing about their own ideas. That's how, you know, innovations happen, right? Just having an idea in your head and not telling anybody about it, you know, you're not going to get the same sort of result. Uh, you know, and as opposed to having conversations and iterating on your ideas. So that's something I'm really, really passionate about and want to bring that experience to students. Sometimes idealize a profession, a person, right? And maybe sitting down with them, that idea yeah. grows. And you're like, wow, yeah. that's exactly what I want to do. I want yeah. to be like them. Yeah. Or it's a great way for the student to say, not my gig. Absolutely. I mean, to them. Absolutely. That's the thing. And, you know, so many students, 
you know, what I'm doing now in my early 40s was not exactly what I envisioned when I was 18. Fortunately, I am doing things, something that's still in the lane of communications, marketing, which has always been, you know, somewhat related. Like I mentioned, you know, 20 years ago, my goal was to be in sports journalism world. Uh, you know, so my career looks a little different. But, you know, say like I had decided to major in accounting and, you know, accounting isn't my thing. You know, I just wasted a lot of time and money doing something that I shouldn't be doing. So, you know, I think if students can go through the interview, interview and innovator experience, interview different interesting individuals and find out like, no, I I don't want to go down that road or yes, I do want to go down that road, then great. I mean, that's a really worthwhile investment of, you know, a couple of hours of time. So uh, you're, you're absolutely right that, you know, getting, you know, it's about gaining part of the process, part of the benefits of uh, this experience is gaining clarity, gaining clarity by hearing from, you know, individuals who are actually doing what you might be interested in doing as a student. Wow. I love your quote. I hope we can, I hope we can capture that the, the, <laughs> from your friend because that, that, that spoke to me because that's like, that's the inertia, right? Like that's yeah. where the rubber meets the road. And, and, and I didn't in classic education in my own classic education, I did not have any of those experiences. And I wish we always talk to people and we go, Oh, I wish I had a teacher that did that. I wish yeah. someone pushed me that way. And it's watching, you know, watching, I've, this is a, I always share about my kids, but my my son during this whole quarantine time had the most horrible experience with the schoolwork. It was just a debacle, but he, yeah. wants, to be, he wants to be a YouTuber and he's talked about this for a while. And I said, all right, let's do this thing. Mm -hmm. And now he is like, he went through the entire process with the with bumps and bruises and law, losing a video and editing, but it was that experience and it was just, he now has so much knowledge because of what he did. And yeah. I love the idea for our teachers, our educators out there to learn this, your process, because it's, it's traditionally very difficult for teachers even today to get comfortable with that. That's a lot of uncertainty that yeah, you as an certainly. educator are dealing with because you don't know where they're going to go with those things and yeah. you not know how to solve one of their problems. And that's, and I, I'm hoping you can speak to that because that's a difficult thing for educators sometimes to. So, you know, one thing I'll say is, you know, and I have younger children. I have a six year old and an eight year old. And like everybody, you know, we were kind of thrown into this, you know, chaos of suddenly I'm working, my wife and I are working and we have, uh, you know, we have to get kids on Zoom calls. And, you know, I, yeah, yeah. in the school where my kids went to, they did the best that they could. And, you know, it was unprecedented circumstances. And, you know, I would give them, you know, five stars for effort in terms of the experience, like the practical experience, like just putting kids, regardless of their age in front of Zoom calls and, you know, and, you know, hearing a professor talk or a teacher talk about a subject, you know, there's obviously a lot of, uh, you know, issues and, and, and challenges to that in terms of getting optimal learning experiences. And so what I would say is, you know, the benefit of having your, your son, you know, creating YouTube videos, I mean, that is like great learning experiences that, you know, and it's experiential, he's, he's doing, right? And so, you know, in so many different school districts and in so many different universities, we don't know exactly what the academic year is going to look like at any point in my life. There's never been such uncertainty. Uh, but certainly there will be more emphasis on providing great online learning experiences for students, regardless of whether that's a, you know, more so than ever, right? And so what I would say is, you know, providing students the opportunity to create content. That is something that they can do fully online. That is something that, you know, with a little bit of guidance, with a little bit of, uh, you know, examples and best practices, you know, then setting students free to go and do that in a, in a safe way uh, is something that can be executed, you know, very without a whole lot of effort. And then the student, you know, so for example, in my, in my interview and innovator course, I have eight different modules. Each module is about five minutes long. So in total, this course is about 40 minutes long. But after each module, the student needs to go do something. So they need to figure out who do I want to interview? How am I going to reach out to that person and, and do an interview? How am I going to then write an article based on the interview that I conducted? How am I, so all that is quote unquote online learning. So there'll be multiple hours of uh, work involved with this process and it's an online experience, but there's very little instruction, top-down instruction from, from myself or from a you know, professor. It's really the students doing. So I would really encourage uh, educators who are listening, who want to expose students to entrepreneurship and also give them the opportunity to you know, um, benefit from some of these other uh, you know, outcomes like 
communication skills, like building a digital footprint, like enhancing a student's network, give them the opportunity, give your students an opportunity to create content by connecting with others. And, you know, you have alumni, you have uh, different stakeholders involved with your school or institution. Find a way to connect them and let those students create content based on the experiences of those who have more experience. You know, there's so many things running in my head right now. I have two or three questions, but I'm going to start with can you give us like a really wow standout that student blew my mind away? Give, give us a couple examples of how this has worked for students. Sure, yeah, thank you. So uh, there's a student I'm working with from Rollins College. Uh, her name is Haley. And she's interested in uh, being an entrepreneur in the clothing space, retail, um, fashion industry. She discovered, are you familiar with the clothing store, Jay McLaughlin? No, I, I had not been familiar with it either, but you know, she, either. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, I, I go clothes shopping <laughs> once every, <laughs> I go clothes shopping once every 20 years, so hence I, I don't really know this space so well. But anyway, this is a store, this is a clothing retail chain. There's 140 stores throughout the United States, Jay McLaughlin. This student, Haley, uh, knew one of her students whose dad was the founder of this company, and you know, tapping into her in you know, weak tie network. She identified this uh, founder and did an interview with him and wrote an article that is published at globalinnovatorsacademy.com. And it's a brilliant article in which the student, in this case, Haley, writes about the experiences of the entrepreneur. What are the entrepreneur's key uh, insights and, and uh, advice for students and then thirdly, what I think is really important, and there's a lot of different ways you can structure an article, but what I encourage students to do is, okay, you heard the story of the entrepreneur, you heard the, the entrepreneur's insights for you as a you know, up and coming entrepreneur or whatever uh, career you're interested in. And then the third part that I emphasize is what are you going to do about that? Like what are, what are the actions that you're going to take? How are you going to apply the insights from what the individual shared. And that forces you to you know, think through, you know, well, okay, this person says do X, Y, and Z. Well, what am I going to do? How am I going to put that into practice? And forcing people to, regardless of the exercise, forcing people to apply their learning and actually write it down, just that process alone can bring a lot of results. So that's one example. Uh, a high school student I'm working with, she goes, she's a student at Perry High School in Arizona. Uh, very shy, reserved young lady, but also very ambitious at the same time. And she was a little overwhelmed by the idea of reaching out to someone new for the first time. She reached out. She's in Arizona. She connected with an entrepreneur in Korea, right? And did a uh, interview with this guy. A similar a guy had interests that are aligned to her interests. Wrote a great article. And, you know, she talked about how you know, I was asking her, like, what about this experience? And she said, before, I was really overwhelmed by the idea of reaching out to someone I don't know. And now it doesn't really feel like a big deal. And so, you know, kind of like breaking the ice, you only have to do this a couple times uh, before, you know, it's become something like, you know, for me, anyway, you know, having done lots of interviews and reaching out to lots of people over the years for content ideas, as well as for other types of things, it's no big deal now, right? And I imagine for you, you know, hosting a podcast it's maybe the first time you hosted the podcast. It was a little overwhelming to reach out to an influencer to try to get them to come on your podcast. But once you do it once, you know, it becomes kind of, I wouldn't say second nature, but it's a lot easier to do that on an ongoing basis. And so I want to give students that opportunity. That's so true. And also don't listen to our first podcast. And <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's pretty, it's pretty awesome. It's pretty funny. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we'll start it, from somewhere. We all start from somewhere. <laughs> that really is that really is very true because it's, it's getting, you know, getting used to that. I, the first, I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, just even now reaching out to somebody would still be a little intimidating for me. If, you know, if it was someone I, you know, someone I looked up to or someone I, I would be like, Oh, I'm a little, I'd be a little shy and a little reserved yeah. about it. But um, so I can see for, for someone much younger, that would be even more difficult. But. Yeah. You know, the one thing I'll say though, to that is when you reach out to someone and you say, I want to pick your brain, I don't know who you are. I want to just pick your brain. It's really one-sided, right? I'm coming away. Like, you know, the person who does that can say, okay, I'm giving back. I'm, you know, maybe I'm, I mean, hopefully that person's a lifelong learner. And the idea of being a lifelong learner is you can learn from somebody, you know, whether they're 20 years more experienced than you or 20 years less experienced than you. But really it's quite one-sided. Uh, there's really not much for the person whose, you know, brain is being picked. Uh, 
But when that person knows that you're, when you're reaching out to someone and saying, I'm offering you value because I'm going to create a piece of content about you. And it's going to be a very nice piece of content in which your beautiful story is articulated and your words of wisdom for the next generation is articulated for others to see, you know, there's a different value proposition to that. So you can feel like you're going in, you know, you're, you as the student are going to learn, obviously, and you're you know, doing this as part of a project and an experience, but you can then, you know, approach that thinking that you're going to bring value to the individual that you're reaching out to because you're giving that person visibility. So that's just a different kind of lens of a way of approaching that. That is an, I'm so glad you said that because that's something that I didn't learn for a really long time. And, and, and especially when it comes to things like, I mean, that applies across the board, right? So when it comes to Mm -hmm. things like, your resume or your cover letter or you know, just anything, anything that you're trying to convince somebody to help you with by sharing with them what they're, what they're getting for doing this is, is such a powerful lesson. So I'm glad, I'm glad that you shared that because that's not something, again, something that traditionally goes down <laughs> in schools. Can we talk yeah. about funny, you know, uh, Twitter are doing some content development for a couple of um, projects right now. And you mentioned a lot of our key words. Um, value proposition is huge. And I, I think it is, it's fun. To, it's almost flipping how we view value because the value in business, uh, you find everything online that says, what is your business about? Who are you serving? But then to take it a step further and say, not just, you know, I got this great product, but it really, what's in it for them. And, and then it yep. becomes another conversation. And, and with your communications too, I, I love that you mentioned Korea in this young woman's journey because um, that's created what we talk about global community, you know, mm-hmm. and it's so mm-hmm. easy these days, I think, to create a global community it is. Um, in communications, which actually I want to find out, tell me about your experiences. You spent a lot of time in Europe. Yeah. And, and tell me a little bit about, like, or tell us the differences in what you found in communications and student learning and, and, Anything you want to share about being there and the differences you see? You know, um, you know, so it's like funny, you, you know, doing like I was doing a lot of media relations and obviously there's differences like in media markets between, you know, Switzerland where I was living and Italy. And, you know, the, I was doing some media relations in, in China with completely different media landscape, uh, the U.S. So there's always cultural nuances. But at the same time, I just think there's one thing that's just universal and is necessary, and that's a clear message. You know, can you deliver a clear message that brings value to other people? And regardless of what culture that is, or regardless of, you know, obviously you want to communicate the language, you know, you want to, my French is, I speak French, but not great, but, you know, you want to be able to, you know, communicate in the language uh, of the person. But as long as you're communicating in a way where there's, where there's value, and, and there's a clear message, what's in it for the individual. You know, I think for me, that's kind of like one of the key learnings from living 10 years abroad is like, yeah, you know, yeah, there's, of course, there's differences, there's cultural nuances from all these different places all over the world. Uh, but the power of just clear, concise communication is is universal. And, uh, you know, that's something I, I, I have a student I'm working with right now who's from Russia. Uh, and uh, he goes to Penn State University. And, you know, he's really involved in this project. And actually, a couple of... Uh, Last year, uh, I was talking to a colleague of mine who was working with students in Moldova, and he was saying, oh, boy, like, you're, uh, Toy, you made the point, oh, this is really overwhelming, talking to, uh, reaching out to people who you don't know, right, and, and giving students the opportunity to reach out to students you don't know. This individual was saying, oh, well, in East, Eastern Europe, in Moldova, well, that's really, really uh, difficult to get students to do that. And I understand that, and I, I know there's a kind of a different type of culture. This student who I'm working with, uh, who's Russian, no problem reaching out to anyone. And he actually was reaching out to, he was trying to set up interviews. What I do in the course is I say, okay, reach out to four different, I have in mind four different individuals you want to reach out to. Maybe two are people you don't know who are, you know, you want to say like a bit out of your league or a bit like really high, high level influencers. Doesn't hurt to try to reach out to them. Now you might not get a positive response uh, and that's fine. So have, have in mind some other individuals too. So are there individuals that you are, you know, you're, family member can connect you to somebody or a, this example that I shared of a student who knew who knew someone whose father was the CEO of a really uh, important company. Uh, but anyway, the point about, and most, I say that, you know, reach out to any influencer you want. Most people aren't going to reach for the stars. This guy, Andre, he didn't care. He was going for the top and he's Russian, right? And so, um, 
I think one of the other things too is like we oftentimes put people into like cultural buckets, you know, those from Eastern Europe, they're very reserved. They're not going to reach out to, uh, you know, they're, they're going to communicate in a certain way. Uh, and I think, you know, there's always exceptions and there are obviously tendencies, but I always think it's important to give people, everybody like a fair chance in terms and, and not to kind of silo them into a certain way of thinking and a certain way of doing things. So talk about a little bit more about the, if I wanted to become a student in the Global Innovators yeah. Academy, talk about that yeah. process a little bit. Yeah, cool. Thanks for asking. Uh, so basically I work with, with uh, schools. So uh, the school would uh, work with me and then they would bring their students uh, to the project. Uh, and so there's a program that's for entrepreneurship. Uh, so if uh, you are a university center and you're focused on, you have an entrepreneurship center at your university and you want to expose your students to uh, entrepreneurs and have them go through this process. So that's one way where I would work with a school. Uh, you know, and I think one of the real benefits for the school is it's not only giving students a great experience and, and having them learn all these different skills, expose them to other ideas. Uh, there's also the real value in terms of connecting alumni to students. So oftentimes, student alumni interactions are very much, um, they feel a bit orchestrated. You know, you have a bunch of people in a room and, you know, I for one don't enjoy networking when I'm in a big room with lots of people. I much rather have a conversation like this. And so by, yeah, so by facilitating a way where an alumnus is able to, to interact with a student, you're really fostering kind of alumni student engagement in a very meaningful way where there's value for everyone involved. And then there's also the idea for, um, you know, the entrepreneurship center where you are having students essentially serve as your marketing communications ambassadors because they are creating content and that content can again be leveraged by the centers in, in the center's newsletters and the center's uh, social media, connecting the content to what their strategic goals are. So uh, entrepreneurship centers at universities, career development centers at universities. Uh, I'll also have a high school program where it's bo both focused on the career track as what, what do I wanna be when I grow up, as well as an entrepreneurship track if a student is particularly interested in entrepreneurship. Uh, so mainly the, the way the program is designed is to work with, to collaborate, for me to collaborate with partner schools and then to make this experience available to students. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm curious as a, uh, you know, you're, you're very innovative and, and um, a great thought processor. Where, how would your life be different if you had had that opportunity in college to go through your program? Huh. Well, I guess, unfortunately, I'm, I'm aging myself here. Digital communications wasn't what is, what is <laughs> I would have been in like some uh, old uh, newspaper somewhere. Uh, the idea of building a digital footprint wasn't really in vogue in the late 90s. But um, yeah, I mean, look, there's so many examples of students who now who are, uh, so I'll, let's say like this. If you look at a student's digital presence, you'll see one of three things. You'll either see nothing. So if you go into a student's LinkedIn profile, you would either see nothing that's really there, right? Their name, they're at a university, but it's really kind of empty, uh, which is normal, right? They don't have 20 years of experience. Uh, the second thing you might see if you Google the student's name is very negative, bad things. So you might see inappropriate photos, you might see inappropriate content, right? Um, so the, the first one is kind of a neutral reaction. The second one is a really negative reaction, right? And so there's many, there's many instances of people who have like lost jobs because of, of posting and, and creating inappropriate content, whatever that might be. And then the third example would be the ideal one, which is students who are creating, who obviously they can't show 20 years of experience on their LinkedIn profile, but they can show that they're creating content. They can show they're engaging with people. They can show they have interests. And so in answer to your question, if I was a student now and I was able to go through my program, you know, I love creating content. I love networking. I love, I'm obviously very passionate about what I've created. And so I would obviously be, uh, you know, taking up the, the opportunities that are associated with that. And so, you know, if I was a, a 19 year old kid, ideally you would Google Kevin Anselmo and you would see, you know, great content that's aligned to my objectives. And you would go to my LinkedIn profile and you would see a robust profile that, you know, speaks well of me and would hopefully lead me to, uh, you know, the right career opportunities. So 
That's how we I think That's a fun thinking. question. I never thought about it that way. That very fun. <laughs> we, thank our, we thank our wonderful marketing person, Megan, for bringing that question to us. Um, I think what I see from hearing you talk, Kevin, is that your passion would still be in communications. But you yeah. and I started this business 15 years ago. Perhaps. 20, you know, had you had someone like you to have to guide you to say, ask the right questions rather than going yeah. and working for a traditional setting, but there's nothing wrong with that. But I can see it might've pushed you forward for sure. Sure. Know? I mean, yeah. I mean, so much of our lives are like random conversations with people. So my opportunity to go to Switzerland was because of my aunt introducing me to her neighbor who then introduced me to the executive director of a sport federation in Lausanne, Switzerland. Random connection. You know, I'm fortunate. Actually, I just read a great book by Julia Freeland Fisher called Who You Know. It's all about social uh, con- having social uh, connections within our educational experiences. And the book highlights the disparities between those who come from low income backgrounds and those who come from you know middle class or more affluent backgrounds. You know, I was fortunate my my random aunt's neighbor knew someone who knew someone and off I go to Switzerland for 10 years and meet my wife, my life's completely different, right? So um but you know n- and, and there's kind of the difference between like your uh, strong connections and your weak connections. You know, here's an example of a weak connection, a strong connection leading me to a weak connection, leading me to an opportunity. Uh, and I think as much as we can foster in our education in, in, in the classroom, opportunities for students to build those weak connections that can ultimately lead to other opportunities because you never know. I mean, how did you get to your chair where you're sitting at today? I'm sure you can probably point to like a, a few random bizarre conversations, interactions. The person sitting on the screen with me, I got here because of toys. So, you know, <laughs> before I got here, a new toy. Yeah, but we met in a very random way. Yeah. I said, I how did you meet? Good. Yeah. We were on the same team um, for a, a, it was a trapeze competition. Mm-hmm. And and she was actually holding my feet. That's hilarious. So, <laughs> wait, that does that's not how your story played out. That's not. <laughs> you were kind of like I never whined. I don't know. No, but you know, my, but my story, you know, yeah. In in some ways, Troy and I've met that way. In other ways, we were together on a project <laughs> when I was living in another state, and she came in to say, "Hey, we got this great project," and I started working with her. I had no idea it was going to lead to my next job um, because I started interviewing and then I'm like, okay, Toy, you mentioned that might be a possibility. Like, where is it? I'm ready to, you know, push the button and go. So, and I'm really big on what you're saying and that I try to teach my own kids and I do a lot of mentoring with kids through um, what we do is ask the question. Like you said, the weak connection could become the passion, could become the job. Absolutely. If you never ask the question, which is what you're teaching students to do, yes. then you'll never know the answer for yeah. yourself or whatever. Yeah. So. You know, one of the points that is underscored in Julia's book, which I mentioned, is that opportunity is not only about what you know, but it's about who you know. And she says this a lot more eloquently than I do, but you know, she talks about how you know, so much of our education is focused on the what you know, right? And not enough emphasis, in a nutshell, is on who you know. And it's the who you know that, you know, can randomly lead to these opportunities where, you know, we have these different, you know, opportunities, career paths, et cetera. And so as much as we in, in education can create those pathways to connection that lead to opportunities, uh, the better. And I, you know, I view our current state of the world in the midst of a pandemic as a real opportunity to take advantage of that uh, because we have we have more reason to be connected online because we have to be. Right. I, I love that concept. We usually ask the question of our guests and I'll let you add to your answer because I think you've already given most of the answer about, you know, what advice might you give to an educator, either, you know, either K through 12 or, or university or whatever, mm-hmm. um, if they want to start, if they want to start building those kinds of connections, because one of the things we hear from almost all of our guests that are successful in this space is community, 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 community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, all day long. Right. Yes. So so I wonder if you could speak to that. And and if I'm, let's say I'm a, let's say I'm a high school teacher and I'm listening to this podcast and I go, wow, that's really cool. What's, what's the one action step I could 
do to get started bringing that to my my own students? I would say try. I mean, try different things, you know, step outside what you're, you know, you might be accustomed to doing. You know, and I guess think about the question. Are you helping your students with the what as much as you're helping the students with the who? And if you can answer yes, then I guess keep doing what you're doing. If you can, if your answer is no, well, then you might want to think about, no, not you might want to think about it. You definitely want to think about what are the different ways that you can experiment to make that happen. Uh, I think just you know, resting on your loyalty and saying, you know, my students are learning, you know, writing, you know, the, the, the necessities of education, great, but make sure that you're focusing on the who as well. And uh, there's so many different fun ways we can be doing this. You mentioned the word community. You know, there's so many fun ways that you can build community if we're just a little bit uh, deliberate and intentional and experimental in trying to make that happen. So that would be my thought on that. That's excellent. Unfortunately, we're coming to our close. This flew by. I'm looking at my clock. I'm like, what? <laughs> um, so I would love for you to tell us how we can reach out to you, particularly how can uh, schools, you're saying yep. that's the avenue to get to your academy and the Innovator, Global, Global Inter Innovators Academy, can't say that, um, and any other ways to connect with you. Thank you for that opportunity. So go to globalinnovatorsacademy.com. Uh, there you will see a, a little bit more overview about the program. You can access the student articles. And I think accessing the student articles is really a great way to see firsthand what this experience entails because you can see the result and you can see how student, you can read how students are interacting with entrepreneurs and what they're learning. Uh, my email is kevin at experientialcommunications.com. And I would love to hear from anybody listening, uh, anybody who might be interested in partnering, as well as anybody who just has any sort of feedback or ideas or what kind of things that you are doing as well to uh, foster this type of learning environment in your classroom. And I thank you both, Toy and Laura, so much for letting me be a guest on the show. Partner, you're looking at the two people. We're ready to partner. So, <laughs> well, Laura, Laura, I'm sure your your brain was was smoking like mine was. I'm thinking of because Laura mentioned we're working on some 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 projects, and I'm like, oh my gosh, we can totally like link to your your stuff and and share mm -hmm. that because I think it's such a great it's such a great idea. I wrote down all these notes like selfishly for things that I'm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what we all do, right? I mean, I, I'm consuming your content, taking notes, thinking, what are these people doing that I, you know, what work can I be learning? So bravo to that. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you, Kevin, so much. You've been absolutely delightful. And we hope that maybe we can, as our journeys continue, maybe we can have you back and we'd love to more about how how this whole your whole would love to and perhaps if you're ever interested we could have some of the students who have interviewed entrepreneurs uh yeah. be, just, just join the podcast as well i'm sure they would yes, welcome that opportunity exactly. super super cool absolutely thank you thank you fun.